We are very excited to have you all here with us today. My name is Marguerite McLean. I am one of the associate directors of admission here at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and joining us tonight, um, we have three uh, alum of the university. Matt, I know you are taking a gap year um, to, to work on your business, but soon to be alum of the university. Um, and this evening, we really want to talk about um, engineers and the businesses that they have started. Um, so really kind of thinking about engineers and that connection that they have to entrepreneurship. Um, so joining us tonight, um, we have Chioma Onukwira, uh, we have Matt Campagna, and we have Chris Wentz. Um, and they are all going to talk a little bit about their experience here at Case Western Reserve University, um, a little bit about what they are currently doing now as uh, they are all um, working in, in the field of entrepreneurship and business and have all started their own businesses. Um, so to kind of kick us off tonight, um, I would love if each of you could introduce yourselves and maybe talk a little bit about your path to CWRU. Chioma, if you want to kick us off. Yes, so hi everyone. My name is Chioma. So my path to CWRU is a kind of funny one. In high school, I kind of went to this medical academy for high schoolers who wanted to get a head start um, on learning medicine. So I went to high school for that. However, I joined a robotics team and they were part of the engineering academy and I just fell in love. So senior year, I changed all of the schools that I applied for. So instead of applying to schools that are very strong medically, I decided to apply to schools that are very strong in engineering. And how we found Case was my mom literally Googled top 10 schools for biomedical engineering. And, and, and Case popped up, I applied, got accepted, which I was really surprised. and they gave me the most scholarship money and that's how I came, that's how I came to Case. And Chioma, you're originally from Houston, correct? Yes, Houston, Texas. Yes. Uh, Matt, do you wanna go next? Just in the same order where she announced <laughs> us. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, Matt Campagna from uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, I guess my, my path to case was uh, I was always really into uh, engineering, um, specifically like uh, electronics. Um, when I was when I was in high school, um, became became very interested. Got into some some pretty interesting products in prosthetics, uh, strength augmentation devices. ISAF was probably um, that's the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair was probably my uh, biggest sort of uh, extracurricular activity when I was in high school, but pretty close to all of the science teachers that I had. Um, and so looking at colleges, I was very interested in, in ones that were strong in engineering, but where I could actually um, build things. And so, uh, you know, case with Thinkbox was obviously uh, very high up on the list. And uh, so applied, got waitlisted, so it took some time, but uh, you know, eventually got in and was happy to take it and, uh, you know, loved the, the people that I met there. Cool. <clears throat> and uh, hey, guys, I'm Chris. Uh, apologies for my lighting. I, I probably need to figure out a way so I don't look like a freaking vampire on these Zoom calls. Um, but uh, anyway, I've, uh, I've been kind of an entrepreneur and a computer science lover uh, ever since middle school. Um, I uh, started a few different ventures in middle school and high school, um, one of which uh, a big video gamer growing up. I loved the video game Halo and Call of Duty. And uh, I started this advertising network. Uh, an advertising network is kind of like Google. Google, where Google matches advertisers with publishers, people who have ad space, started one of these uh, for the Halo video game called Ad Halo. We grew it to be the largest in the uh, Halo category for what that's worth, serving even more ads than Google and others. Um, and uh, I knew from an early age that I was really interested in entrepreneurship. I've always looked up to people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and, um, you know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin and all those people who have really made, uh, you know, the tech community what it is. Um, so I knew that I always wanted to do something entrepreneurship related. But I've also had this 
passion for programming and I've loved designing websites and all that um, ever since a young age. Um, so uh, when looking at a school to go to, um, Case was the only school and also the best school uh, for getting a kind of co-degree program. They have uh, what they call the Masters of Engineering and Management at Case. Highly recommend the program. Can't say enough great things about it. Um, a lot of our, uh, you know, I, I myself have gone through the program um, as well. Well, I actually dropped out of the program because every key was starting, my company, every key was starting to work out at the time, but uh, did the first semester of the program, loved it, have hired uh, many employees out of the MEM program. I uh, can't say enough great things about it. But anyway, that's why I applied to Case was because it was the, the really the school to go to for somebody that's interested in both engineering and entrepreneurship. And uh, since then, I've started my company, Every Key, which uh, I, I guess we're not getting into that part yet, are we? So uh, yeah, that's awesome. me. Awesome. Well, that's a great. Thank you. That's you know kind of a great transition. Um, when I was kind of preparing um, for this session, I um, did some uh, creepy googling and reading up on all you guys, um, and I don't think I could ever do justice to um, you know the things that you've started and and you know what you've built. So I would love for you all to maybe just take a couple minutes and talk about um, you know the businesses that that you've built and kind of what those look like. Uh, so I guess I'll go first. So the business that I started is Chimu. Chimu is an African fashion platform that essentially connects people with seamstresses. We usually work mainly with seamstresses from Africa in order to give them more economic opportunity. Um, so the idea from Chimu came like, I'm Nigerian American and growing up Nigerian, it was very hard to get clothes that would fit and everything was like made to order. So my mom would like take my measurements, send it over to some to one of my cousins in Nigeria, and then they would find a seamstress to make it for me. And then like this was before the days of WhatsApp, I couldn't contact my cousin. So I didn't have a say in the look, the style, even the color of the clothes. And back then, how clothes would come from Nigeria to America for me was we would have to wait for someone to come to America. So we would just like wait years for these clothes. And as a child growing up, what fits you today doesn't fit you tomorrow. So I thought, why can't there be a simpler way to kind of streamline this process? You know, people can go to their local stores and buy it. So if they try it on, they like it. If they don't, they can keep it. And that's how Chimu, um, came about. So Chimu has been through some changes throughout the years. Um, now African fashion is gaining a lot of popularity in the in the US, which is which is great. So you know, there are a lot of African fashion brands doing amazing things. And I think I read up on this one African fashion brand that sells at, I'm forgetting the mall, but it's like a big retail mall that they're selling. So you can actually go to a store and buy some African clothing. So it's just like my dream was like finally realized. So Chimu has recently taken a pivot as of late. And right now we are just focusing on creating like wearable art, you know, so expressing yourself through fashion, but we still value transparency in the supply chain. So we tell people, who makes their clothes? Where did we get the supplies from? Who made it? We try to be like as transparent as possible because we're trying to make the connections between people and the actual seamstresses and people who make them behind the scenes that in the fashion industry you usually don't get to see. So uh, that's how Chimu looks like now. So a lot of it's just creating um, one-off pieces, have people have worn in music videos, galas. It's been a very interesting experience. Like there have been a lots of mishaps, <laughs> um, lots of mistakes, but it, it's been a lot of fun. You really learn how to connect with people. You learn how to like solve people's whys. Um, so you get to understand the reason that people do things. And with Chimu, I learned the reason why people buy clothes is yes because they look cool but also like they have a special connection to them where they reminds them of their home place or reminds them of something so i would not have learned that if it wasn't for chimu so i credited that 
to like making the Chimu business and then just learning from the many failures um, that Chimu went through, just learning that, you know, whatever happens, you can always pick yourself up. And as long as you're having fun with it, it doesn't matter um, how many times you lose or win. So yeah, that is how we are operating now. I hope I answered everything. Uh, if I'm missing out anything, please feel free to ask me questions. Yeah, no, that's perfect. And one of the things that I just forgot uh, to say at the beginning for anyone who's tuning in, feel free to, to ask your questions. You should be able to ask them in the Q&A box. Um, so feel free to ask your questions and, and we will try and get to all those. Uh, but with that, Matt, I'd love to hear a little bit um, about your business. Sure. Um, so a reflection does cognitive and visual training and testing for athletes. And just like any other set of muscles, it turns out your vision can actually be trained. And the best athletes um, have, have uh, been shown to exhibit really great visual cognitive skills like peripheral vision, reaction time, depth perception, multiple object tracking, and so on. And it turns out you can actually train those visual and cognitive skills. And so what we built with Reflection is a completely um, streamlined process for training and testing those cognitions with a piece of hardware called the Edge that's a two by six foot touchscreen that collapses um, into a carrying case so that it can travel with our customers wherever they go um, so that they can keep their athletes at their peak and a SaaS solution that allows them to manage their athletes and assign visual cognitive training drills to them and view the results from anywhere. Um, so right now we're serving mostly boutique fitness centers as well as universities and optometrists um, that are working with athletes in order to help get them to the next level. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Matt. So uh, guys, again, I'm Chris. Um, my company uh, is called every key. Um, so we are replacing all of your passwords and keys. I want you to think about all the different passwords and keys that you use on a daily basis. Um, I've got this big bulky key ring here. It's got the key to my house, my car door key, my bike lock key, all my different keys. I've also got hundreds of different passwords that I have to use on a daily basis. Um, each one's a little bit different than, uh, than, than another password, um, but most people use the same password for everything. And because of that, there was over $2 trillion lost last year, not 2 billion, but $2 trillion lost due to password related data breaches. And we wanna solve this problem. So we've done that with every key. It's the world's first universal smart key. When you have this on you and you're close to your phone, your laptop, your tablet, the door to your office, your car door, your house door, your bike lock, anything that would require a password or a key, every key unlocks that thing. It's your universal smart key. And then it locks those back down when you walk away so you don't have to worry about somebody else using them. It also gets you into all your uh, website and app accounts as well. Uh, everything from a social media account to an email account, a bank account. Uh, you can use this in conjunction with two-factor as well. We just release uh, every key plus a fingerprint makes the easiest uh, and most secure. And, and uh, of course, every key plus a face scan, of course, one of the best uh, touchless uh, two-factor solutions that you can have uh, very you know relevant in today's times. Um, so yeah, we, we actually started the idea uh, or we came up with the idea for every key in an entrepreneurship class at case the professor was asking us to um, really come up with any kind of business idea we wanted it could be a product or service that could solve a problem um, and also of course uh, you know make money as well as a business um, and we were talking about how annoying passwords and keys are how unsecure they are how much how cumbersome they are and came up with the idea for every key presented it to the class honestly didn't think much of it. We kind of thought like, hey, wouldn't this be cool if um, Google or Apple were to do something like this? But fortunately for us, a professor came up to us and offered to invest some money into it to get the company off the ground. So we went ahead and, uh, and, and started the company at that point and uh, haven't looked back since. It's been a, it's been a wild ride, uh, raising millions of dollars and getting a lot of sales and everything for the company has been just so much fun. I wouldn't have ever imagined that I'd be uh, doing what I'm doing and at this point, uh, you know, just a few years out of college. Um, also, I, looking at the chat, I see that somebody asked a question. Um, I think it's directed to me because it asked about dropping out of school. Um, can we start to answer those questions now, or is that like out of the format? What, what, what should, should I go ahead and answer? No, go okay, ahead cool. and answer, yeah. 
Okay, great. Awesome. So somebody asked uh, whether or not I was, uh, or like, how was I confident uh, that dropping out of a school was a good idea? How did I know that the business was going to succeed? And that's a great question. Obviously, I was, uh, you know, a little bit um, questioning that myself at the time, right? Um, dropping out of school is a big decision. I've always been a very studious, um, you know, student trying to get good grades and um, stay in school and everything. I had already got my undergraduate degree at the time. So my undergraduate degree was in computer science, and I was pursuing this master's of engineering and management. Um, so I already had my undergraduate degree at the time, which was great. And every key had gotten some of its first funding. We had, um, we had just won a few business plan competitions. Uh, that's one of the great things about case, by the way, is that there's, uh, if you are an entrepreneur, there are plenty of business plan competitions where you can get up and, uh, and, and pitch your, your product or your service or your company. And, uh, a, a, panel of judges will determine who's a winner is and you know you might win ten thousand five thousand twenty five thousand dollars in some cases and that's some good initial funding for the company so at the time where i dropped out we had just uh recently gotten a $100,000 um, loan from the state of Ohio, which is also another great source of funding, um, and another uh, $95,000 uh, uh, kind of loan from the state of Ohio, essentially, as well as sort of, sort of uh, one of the different funding. The one's called Glide Innovation Fund, and the other's uh, NCOTF, North Coast Opportunities Technologies Fund, uh, which also kind of answers some of the other questions in the chat about how we got uh, initial funding for the company. A lot of um, initial business plan competitions, and uh, local funding sources. And then eventually venture capital uh, stepped in at some point. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Chris, you you know made a point, you were kind of talking about how every key stemmed out of an entrepreneurship class that you were taking here on campus. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more kind of about the opportunities or some of the resources that you all took advantage of either on campus, um, things like Sears ThinkBox, LaunchNet, um, but also in the city of Cleveland. Shioma, I know that you were involved uh, with Core City here in Cleveland. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit about kind of um, how those resources um, helped you kind of uh, build um, your businesses. Yeah, so first off, ThinkBox definitely helped Chimu out a lot. So one, ThinkBox was just, it's just a very cool space to be in, even if you're not making anything, just being in the same presence of people making things is enough to like motivate anybody. And what ThinkBox had at the time was like a really cool sewing machine. And at the time I didn't have a sewing machine. So I would always go and think fog. I would always like sew up colorful dashikis, use their um, iron, use their um, photo booth. And other people would just like watch me and some people would help. So that was like very like motivating because I've never had anyone help me with like sewing before. So ThinkBox most definitely helped me. And I know um, if I'm remembering correctly, sometimes ThinkBox do have competitions. So I've gotten some of my initial funding from ThinkBox. So like the Z fund or um, I'm forgetting the fund's name, but a lot of my initial funding did come from ThinkBox and the competitions that they have told me about, because I know people at ThinkBox have connected me to other opportunities that I am like very thankful for. Um, also, just going to case, the professors were really helpful in um, giving advice on how to run a company, especially when you start talking to the professors in more of the management classes. So when I took my grad course for engineering management, I was able to take a entrepreneurship course with Famita. I believe that's her name. And she was very instrumental in helping me like understanding the ins and outs of business and how to think a little bit differently. But of course, different professors, um, like different professors have different styles of teaching. But um, when it comes to Cleveland, Jumpstart, which is how I found out about the Core City Cleveland program, was a really good resource to go to. They would always connect you to resources around Cleveland that you may you may not have known about. They also um, get you access to grant money, 
access to grant money and they also help you with your business plan your marketing plan i know when i joined jumpstart they had a dedicated person to me telling me like the ins and outs of what to do so that's how case and just being in cleveland has helped me with chemo hey uh by the way shioma um while you were talking a few people in the chat were asking about thinkbox and kind of what is thinkbox um sorry if i'm going a little bit off script here but if you'd like to tell people about thinkbox i think you've probably used it a lot more than i have but it's a fantastic uh uh you know a set of resources yes thank you so I'm trying to see how do I describe ThinkFox in all its glory. So think of ThinkFox as a as a collaboration space where you can go in and create, you can collaborate with people, you can network and connect with people. I know last time I was at ThinkFox, I believe they had about, gosh, like five to six floors. They had a collaboration floor that had like um rooms you can go in and work with people they have like whiteboards you can use like a very nice open space to discuss your ideas brainstorm prototype and then when you go up another level they have the prototyping i believe it's called the prototyping floor so this is usually where you see like the 3d printers the sewing machine they have vinyl cutters and not only do they have these um free resources that are free to use but they have trained individuals that know how to use these items so if you need help they will help you out i know i needed help so many times on the laser cutter because i didn't know what a laser cutter was before think box so they have um all of oh excuse me so they have like all of those machinery and very trained people to help you and you learn a lot um from their trainings and just from watching other people do it it it's an it's an amazing space and i really like how think fox like the people who run it are very nice and they're very encouraging i know um ian charnas he like anytime i would talk to him he would always motivate me to do better and to do more because there were some days it was just um running a business is hard so it was just tough but him being there and giving me that support was immense so think box is not just only a collaboration space but it's a prototyping space it's a place where you find your people and think box is different for everyone so maybe other people on the panelists can like jump in and describe like what think box was for them yeah i mean just just to jump in there i mean you can do everything from hold a meeting or just just work to you know use use a um you know use drill presses and cnc machines and and you know, all all of the above and i guess now there's even an incubator there uh, more business resources um I, I think they've opened by this point but somebody might want to fact check that um but but just a second that i mean all of the staff there and and all of the the people who use thinkbox um are just incredibly helpful and I, i've always found that everyone there motivates one another and is always pushing each other um and it, it's open to the public it's not just closed to members of the of the case community so um you know i think it, it's a really great act of generosity and um you know it it, it allows students especially who who you know can't have soldering irons and all sorts of tools in their in their dorm room to actually still make stuff um, so definitely a great resource that everyone should take advantage of. Also, I, I think um, another, another fund, and um, maybe this is what you were talking about, Shoma, was the Student Project Fund. Is that the other one that you were thinking of? I, I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that's a great resource to check out as well. It provides something like, like um, on the order of magnitude of a couple thousand dollars for student projects. Um, so it, it's really helpful if you're trying to get off the ground and you can apply for it, I think, every year. Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely have plenty of great things to say about Thinkbox as well. I won't reiterate what everybody else has said, but um, Thinkbox, great resources, basically the way I kind of sum it up is basically a makerspace on steroids. It's just kind of like everything, anything and everything that you'd need to create a product or a prototype is there in Thinkbox. It's open to the public. Anybody can use it. As a student, you would get um, 
uh, like discounts essentially on uh, on any like materials that you use. You you get to buy materials at the price uh, of those materials. So like for example, if you use a piece of vinyl with the vinyl cutter, you pay whatever cost uh, Thinkbox used um, uh, or paid for for that uh, for that item. But it's um, I, I believe it's fair to say that it is the largest, if not one of the largest, makerspaces in a university in the entire world. And even take out that in a university, it's just it's a gigantic you know, we're talking about a building that's all for, for makers here. Um, <clears throat> one of the floors of Thinkbox that I really like um, is, is actually called the LaunchNet um, program, which I think really needs, uh, or really deserves a lot of um, airtime here on this call as well. Um, LaunchNet is really what gave me the confidence to start every key. After we came up with this idea in this class and we pitched it to the class and the professor offered to invest, you're still kind of questioning like, hey, is this really um, worth starting this company? Is it worth possibly, you know, uh, dropping out of my master's program that I've really looked forward to? Um, to start this company, you, you have all these thoughts going on. And um, for me, there was a guy named Bob Sopko, who is just absolutely amazing. He is kind of the reason that every key uh, is around and has been so successful to this day, currently sits on our board of directors as well. Very happy to have him um, on our board. Anyway, um, I was introduced to Bob through a mutual connection. And Bob just started introducing me to everybody in the Cleveland business community. Everybody from, there's a guy named Charles Stack in Cleveland that was actually, he was the first person to sell anything online. You would think maybe Amazon or some other, um, you know, person may have been, uh, you know, had that claim, but um, he started a website called books.com and, uh, and, and was the very first person to sell anything online. So you get connected to these really influential um, leaders within the Cleveland business community through Bob Sopko and the LaunchNet program. And those people can be really helpful for advice on how to get started. They can be really helpful for funding sources. You know, some of these people are involved with incubators or accelerators or government funding programs within the state of Ohio. Um, they can get you into the business plan plan competitions, the pitch competitions. Um, so definitely, uh, you know, five out of five stars for, for LaunchNet. They've been uh, super helpful to us. And, and same thing with ThinkBox. ThinkBox has been amazing um, for prototyping and product uh, resources. So ThinkBox for the, uh, for the product and uh, LaunchNet for the business side of things. So one of the other questions that I had for you guys, um, can you share maybe one of your favorite or most impactful either classes that you've taken here at the university or maybe, you know, you're thinking of a professor or even a staff member, Chris, like you mentioned, Bob Sobko, um, you know, someone that that's really made kind of an impact on you. I can. Um, so, I, I mean, I could say endless good things about Bob and many others as well. Um, but, but also, I think uh, Scott Shane um, from, from Weatherhead, uh, the, the business school, is, is fantastic. I like to say that there are two types of feedback. There's good feedback and then there's useful feedback. Uh, Scott is the sort of person who will give you useful feedback all of the time, um, you know, completely unfiltered. And uh, I, I always thought that that, that was... Um, you know, a great reality check uh, to, to get that sort of feedback. But on top of that, um, you know, great classes on entrepreneurship. I want to say it's 301 um, where he would have you know, some, some leader, some business leader and, and, you know, big names like Mark Kwame from Drive Capital was one. I want to say he had um, Paul Bukite before I'm blanking on some of the others, but you know, go go check out the class. Some really high quality entrepreneurs um, that would speak to the class, and you could interact. David Rose um, from New York Angels. Um, so major investors, major entrepreneurs that you would get FaceTime with in this course, and would actually get to to talk to them. And and I remember one thing that specifically he did for me, which was was you know sort of silly, but it was great. Was I got to go like um, you know meet these people when they were on campus and like bring them to class and get some some personal time to to just chat with them um and you know get get their opinions on things so i mean he he will always uh do great things for for the students who are, are really interested in in learning <clears throat> 
Uh, yeah, just kind of echoing some of uh, some of that same. Uh, Scott Shane's awesome. Um, Bob Sopko, definitely my number one uh, go-to for business resources, and just really just all around really good guy. That's uh, that's super helpful. Obviously, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't um, also mention the professor uh, that you know kind of gave us that confidence to start the the company that came up to us and offered to invest in you know this crazy idea. This what was originally just a class project. So um, really, I think um, the interesting thing here is that um, when I first started at Case, uh, entrepreneurship was kind of this fringe thing. It was kind of this thing that like, oh, you're a little bit weird maybe if you do entrepreneurship. Um, but now it's become just so mainstream. There's so many people doing it and it's such a popular thing that everybody is supporting entrepreneurs and this entrepreneurial mindset is really something that the campus has, uh, has gotten behind. Um, one really interesting thing. Um, so some of these uh, resources have helped you not only get funding and advice on the company, but uh, Case also um, every year attends CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, and we've been very fortunate to be invited out to CES. Um, on Case's dime, by the way, Case is paying, those booths are not, are not cheap. You know, we've looked into buying one ourselves, and you're talking thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars in some cases uh, to get these booths at CES, and Case will get a few different booths. They'll have a huge line of booths and um, you'll be able to exhibit your startup company on this international stage in front of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And you'll get to meet people like through CES. I've met people like the former CEO of Chrysler who ended up investing in my company, the former or the current CEO of Mercedes Benz who invested in my company, um, the, uh, for, the VP of Samsung. Like you'll meet these like crazy, um, you know, legit people um, through CES. And that was really only possible because of Case and because of them uh, kind of, you know, allowing us to to be a part of that and um, happy to say the case actually has the largest showing of any university in the entire world in the entire world case has more companies at CES than any other university so I think that that really kind of goes to show you how much the university cares about and loves entrepreneurship yeah, so that is like a very great question so of course I would love to say like Bob Sacco Ian Sharness but these people are not my professors so if we're going based on professors, surprisingly enough, one of my polymer scientist professors, so um, my major in undergrad was polymer science and engineering, um, David Schiraldi. So even though he didn't teach entrepreneurship, he, Matt knows what I'm talking about. He's shaking his head. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> oh, okay. Like, so even though he didn't like teach entrepreneurship, I wasn't like any, like he wasn't in the Weatherhead School of Management. He was in the School of Engineering. Um, the classes he taught, like he just didn't teach the engineering side. He taught the business side in terms of like, will people like this? Like, yes, this is cool. This may be cutting edge, but is it fulfilling a need? Which at the time I was going to school was missing in a lot of engineering classes. And um, so, and, and Dave Shaw is a very nice man. You can just talk to him about anything. So just being in his classes and just hearing his philosophy and understanding people, make sure you're solving a problem and understand the problem first before you start creating the solution was very instrumental in how I thought just about my other classes, but also Chimu. Cause sometimes when you, and I don't know if the other panelists will agree with me, when you start your business, you focus on like, you know, this item is like so cool, you know, it can do A, B and C without realizing like, is this what your customer wants? At least that's how it was for me. So yeah, David Shiraldi was definitely one of the professors to go to. So kind of with that, I mean, it sounds like all of you, you know, you're focused on your business while you're here at CWRU. I would love if you could maybe talk a little bit about anything else that you were involved in here on campus. I mean, I think one of the things that really draws students to become interested in the university is, you know, the ability for students not only to pursue engineering and entrepreneurship, but also, you know, to get involved in a ton of other different things. Um, so I would love, you know, if there was any Anything else that you were involved in outside of the classroom to maybe highlight that a little bit? I, uh, I guess I can go first. So, um, I, so outside of the classroom, I was involved in a sorority called Phi Sigma Rho. It is a social sorority for women in STEM fields. So it was, it was a lot of fun because I was able to gather with like-minded individuals who were in the engineering field and the hard sciences where a lot of women are not 
um, in those fields, period. But it was also a good outlet to, you know, have a social life, <laughs> um, for my lack of a better um, term, to have like a social life on campus because Case is a really great school. And with a great school, it's very rigorous. So it is very easy to just retreat to your room and study for the next test and the next test. But it's really important to have a life outside of your books. Um, so that sorority really helped me out of it because if I was by myself, I definitely would have been in my room all the time. So that was one of the main things that I was involved with. And since I was in a sorority, you know, we had to organize um, char um, charity events. We would be encouraged to go to other sororities and fraternities and just other organization events. Like they would give us points for going to networking, um, doing something new. You would get points if you did something new. So that um, was one of the main things I was involved with outside of class that really helped my growth at Case. Yep. Let's see. Um, I, I think that this is not really like a, a structured thing, but I would recommend, um, and this is something that, that I did, was I tried to just meet a new person every week, somebody who I could I could learn something from um, you know, I, at Case, there are a ton of people smarter than you, and so it's great to just soak in as much information as possible. Um, and so for me, I remember it started with, um, I had one professor for my uh, SAGES seminar in uh, freshman year, Anita Howard, and she was just awesome and connected me with um, a ton of different people across the university. I think Bob Sopko was probably one of them. Um, and, and then if you just keep talking to people and keep learning from, from all these, these people that are in the at case where there's such a concentrated amount of great knowledge, you can just form so many connections that will last forever, way past whatever you learn in the classroom. Um, and, and so I think that was probably the most impactful thing for me, um, and I would definitely recommend it to anyone else. Cool. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, for me, I, I don't know, maybe I was a little bit of a loser in college or whatever. I didn't really participate too much in the extracurricular stuff. Um, maybe it's really just because I've always had this passion for entrepreneurship and uh, running a business is a f more than a full-time job, right? You're, you're spending, uh, trying to balance that with schoolwork is challenging. Um, I, there, there are some things that I wish I would have utilized more. Um, in hindsight, I wish I would have become a member of Hackers Society. That's a uh, group of students on campus that are really interested in programming and uh, you know computer science related topics. And they'll all get together and they'll have like hackathons and um, different things like that. I wish I would have uh, participated in that kind of stuff. Um, going back to the startup side, I guess there is one. Um, a, it's too startup. It's very startup -y related, but there's startup weekend. I participated in startup weekend. I think that that's a great, uh, you know, extracurricular that you can do um, outside of class. Um, even if you're not necessarily looking to start a company yourself, if you're just interested in the startup scene, you could go to startup weekend, you could join a team and throughout a, uh, throughout a weekend, you're basically going from the process of starting a brand new team, like creating a team, finding people that you, you mesh wish with, and then, um, coming up with an idea for that business and then going through all the customer discovery, uh, going out and interviewing people on the street, finding out if they would actually want this product, maybe even developing the product in some sense, uh, all in the course of a weekend. So definitely a really awesome uh, you know, activity that you can do. Um, Hacker Society definitely would recommend that. Um, and since I don't have too much else to say on that subject, I'll just go ahead and answer one of the questions that's in the chat. Um, it looks like James uh, Grissom, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, but you're asking if I started every key with other students and that's a great question um, when we came up with the idea in that entrepreneurship class um, there was a group of four of us that came up with the idea together um, two of them were not interested in continuing with the company for whatever reason um, one person was CC um, is the other co-founder of every key I'm really happy to uh, to have worked with her um, and I say to have worked with her because unfortunately she's no longer involved in the business um, her parents had a manufacturing plant in China she's Chinese herself and um, 
um, and they wanted her to uh, to return to China to help her uh, to help them rather uh, run the uh, manufacturing plant and also she wanted to get a master's program so she ended up uh, I bought out her shares in the company um, which you know turned out to be a, a financially really good move for me um, definitely sad to see that she's no longer with the company because we got along really well it was a great partnership um, it's always really important when you're starting a business to find people who can be uh, supportive to you both from a uh, you know work standpoint people who can help you uh, you know you've got this immense amount of load of uh, of, of, of uh, stuff on your back that you got to carry but also from an emotional standpoint CC was also it's great to have somebody to uh, to, to bounce ideas off of and to kind of just uh, kind of remind yourself that you're not freaking crazy for like starting a company while you're in college it's good to have supportive people around you that, that'll help you uh, feel sane throughout the process. So with that, Chris, you know, I know you're kind of talking about um, the timeline and the, the trajectory of your business. I would love if you could each maybe take a couple minutes. Um, there were a few questions within the chat. Um, if you could maybe talk about some of the hurdles that you've encountered um, or challenges while starting your business and then maybe talk about you know, a, a moment or moments, you know, of pride and kind of what you're most proud of um, with, you know, the businesses that you started. I guess I'll go first. Um, so when starting Chimu, one of the first hurdles that I had, at least at the time, because African fashion was not as popular then as it is now, what and because of the location I was in Cleveland was getting people to understand the vision. So a lot of people liked the idea that the clothes were handmade and that they would know um, who made the clothes. But um, I remember one of the people were like, you know, that's a really cool idea. But, you know, it was really hard getting people inspired by your idea. And when you have like a startup or a business, you really want people to like get excited. So for me, that was a big hurdle, was just like have people get excited for something that I was excited about. And then, but that hurdle taught me that you can't do business for everybody. So when I stopped trying to please everybody that I saw, I started focusing more on people who were most likely like my vision already before I started talking to them. So even though it was a hurdle, it was a really good one because I learned a huge lesson out of it. So that was like my initial. And then like lots of small hurdles here and there. Like I bought the wrong thing. Like I may I am messing too much money in one thing versus another thing I could have done or, you know, make a lot of mistakes in marketing and assumptions. It, it, it It's a lot. And like also time management, like I was not the best time manager. So I would always let things fall through the cracks. Cause you know, I had to keep up my grades, but if I kept up my grades <laughs> then my business would also fall through the cracks. Cause you know, I'm not going to meetings or I have to postpone them or give them to somebody else. But it, it, it's been fun. Like the hurdles after you jump over them, um, you find that you've learned, excuse me, you find that you've learned a lot. And sometimes on your hurdles, you find a lot of successes. So ever since starting Chimu, I have dressed, I have dressed models. If any of you have watched America's Next Top Model, I have dressed some of um, the finalists. So, you know, they, they were finalists years down the line. We met Paz and they like, I love your designs. Can I model it for you? So I've had people like, mod like legit models wear my designs. I've had my stuff on a billboard one. So that was a really, happy accomplishment but i think my proudest accomplishment so far with shimu is oh i'm sorry <laughs> is um i was oh my god like i don't know why i'm <laughs> i don't know why i'm forgetting but um one of my proudest moments of chimu was when i went to the forbes 30 under 30 event in detroit um luckily i was able to exhibit there and when i was talking about chimu to people um people really not only resonated with the message but i had a lot of people coming to me saying i've been looking for this <laughs> or like i've been looking for for something like this in Detroit. Cause you know, they're like, I have to go to New York. I have to go to Cleveland. Like Detroit is not known as a hub yet for fashion. 
So they're like, I've been looking for a local person for this. And it just made me feel good because it felt like I was solving somebody's problem. So like that has been my proudest moment so far. Ah, okay, I guess I'll go. Oh, Matt, it looks like you're about to speak. Matt, do you want to go? No, you're good. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll, t I'll take that. Sure. So um, as far as like challenges and, and problems that we needed to overcome, man, I mean, there's, there's so many, obviously, right? I mean, starting a company is just uh, such a challenging thing to do. I think that that's why, why a lot of us do it is just because it's, uh, it's, it's genuinely one of the hardest things that you could possibly do with your life, in my opinion. And, and but also one of the most rewarding, of course, right? Um, there was a time where, um, you know, obviously, for every key to be this universal smart key, it's got to connect with your phone, and your laptop and your tablet and your car door, all of these things simultaneously, the, the keyword there simultaneously it's got to do those uh, connect with all of them at once and we use bluetooth as our primary technology because that's kind of the standard for device to device communication and without going into too many details there was an issue where bluetooth is one to one you can have one single bluetooth device connected to one other bluetooth device but you can't add a third device into that um, pairing mechanism so um, we had our only engineer at the time this was when we were first starting the company he was like chris this just isn't possible the, the whole premise of this company that you're starting just isn't going to happen because you can't even do this this is this is just straight up impossible and he actually left the company he left the company because he didn't think that we were going to be able to overcome this obstacle and and i gotta admit that it, it was his his argument was convincing but you also as an entrepreneur you want to make the impossible possible you want to overcome those hurdles and uh and and find a solution so after really putting our heads together and uh figuring out a better way to do this um we came up with a solution and um just uh, go grab something really fast that's uh, sitting right next to me. We ended up uh, essentially coming up with a really inventive way to make one Bluetooth device talk to multiple devices at once. And we ended up getting a US patent off of that, which is a super valuable patent. We've actually made hundreds of thousands of dollars licensing this patent to other companies, possibly millions of dollars in the future. I think that patent has a lot of value. And we are the only company now that can have one single Bluetooth device connect to multiple devices simultaneously. It's a really valuable valuable thing that uh, that we were able to develop and I guess you know it sounds so generic this whole story of like you turned a challenge into an opportunity but that's genuinely what a lot of challenges have been for us is that um, when it, challenges are are fun in that they bring the whole team together they're really hard to overcome and once you do overcome them the team is stronger the company is stronger you might create value for the company there's been multiple times where you know i hate to say it but we've been close to not being able to make payroll and when everybody just gets really really um you know, excited about trying to raise some more money for the company or getting sales up to try to solve that problem. It happens and you end up getting out of it stronger. And uh, they're, they're really, at the end of the day, you feel like there's really no challenge that we can't overcome because I've just seen how much shit we've been through. And I think that we're going to be able to get through anything else that, that life throws at us. Yeah, that, that's, uh, it's very well put. I think, um, you know, it's probably probably timely too, but you can uh, never miss out on a good crisis. I think there's probably like a Churchill quote or something along those lines. <laughs> but, but um, you know, it, I think that probably, probably the most difficult thing is, is managing, you know, you're, you're responsible when you start a company for, for, you know, the, the well-being of your team, for your investors. I mean, um, your customers, you have, you have all these different stakeholders that, that you report to more or less, you know, you, you might think like, Oh, your you know, your, your team all does what, what you say, but you know, as, as a, as a leader, you're, you're a servant to them. And so, uh, you know, every day having to manage their, their expectations and, and really, um, you know, help, help your team succeed can be, can be a roller coaster. I mean, you have people who, who will tell you, you know, on your own team, like, like Chris just said that, you know, what you're doing can't be done. Or you'll you'll find out down the road that you know a founder um, didn't wasn't really a great culture fit. Now you have to figure out how to separate, and um, or or a CTO in our case. And uh, so I think you know along the way you have lots of challenges like that. Most of them end up I think being related to to um, you know people some 
sometimes you get technical problems as well. But, um, you know, I think, I think a lot of times what, what I've learned is that after you figure those out or, you know, you, you make the decision to, to part ways with, with somebody or, or you have to change up the structure of the organization, you know, the, the team will probably be the, the first group of people to say, you know, I'm glad you did that. Or, you know, like you, you made the, you made the right call or I can't believe it took that long. Or, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge and, and a really big responsibility to, to, to lead people that, uh, again, I, I, I have a philosophy that, you know, I, I won't hire anyone that I don't think is smarter than me. Um, and I think, you know, leading those people every day and trying to, to help them succeed is always a challenge, but it's extremely rewarding. I mean, in, in our case now, I'm, I'm really glad to brag about the quality of our team. I mean, we have some of the best engineers I've ever met. Our CTO um, IPO'd with Liberate and uh, led what, what basically became um, uh, OpenGL at, at SGI, um, just outstanding um, talent on our team. Uh, the, the leader of our marketing uh, was director of e-commerce at shopping.com, uh, 411 Tactical, uh, was in the uh, C-level operations for marketing at Compaq. And so, you know, I, I think th those are the sorts of things that, that at the end of the day are really rewarding um, when you have to deal with those, those challenges every day. Thanks so much, guys. Um, so I know we're kind of nearing the end of, of our time this evening. Um, I would love, you know, if each of you could maybe give kind of a, a short piece of advice to, you know, the students who are here joining us. Um, you know, some of these students may be coming to CWRU um, in the fall. So I guess the best piece of advice that you can give to these students, um, you know, who are interesting, who are interested, excuse me, in, in engineering and entrepreneurship and, um, you know, obviously coming from all the experience that you have. Uh, I guess I'll start. Um, so <laughs> persistence is uh, kind of the number one uh, quality that I think an entrepreneur really needs to have uh, to succeed. And, and same thing with engineering as well. When you're faced with, uh, with a challenge um, or if somebody's turning you down, if somebody's saying no, um, keep trying, keep, uh, keep, keep at it. Um, keep going. Even when everybody else thinks you're crazy, you know, I think Steve Jobs said, you know, first they think you're crazy, then you change the world. And, you know, that couldn't be more true for just about every entrepreneur that I've ever met. Um, you just keep going, just, uh, just, just keep trying, uh, try different things. Obviously the, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, but keep trying different, uh, different uh, routes towards uh, accomplishing your goal. And eventually you will. I think that the best entrepreneurs out there and the ones that we look up to and the ones that they write books and, and make movies about are the entrepreneurs who didn't give up. Um, they might not necessarily be the smartest entrepreneurs out there. You know, Elon Musk seems really smart in his interviews and everything, but I've met people 10 times smarter than Elon Musk that just gave up earlier. They just, uh, they, they, they just maybe didn't have quite the same drive and didn't work as hard as he did. Um, so uh, I don't know, just, just keep working, keep, uh, keep up the, the hard work and, and you'll, you'll achieve anything. You, you can achieve anything with uh, the right amount of work. I think that um, if you're not careful, universities can, can lead to a lot of groupthink. And so my advice would be, don't be afraid to be a contrarian and have your own opinions and voice them and, you know, stick with them and, and force people to prove you wrong. If, if you have an opinion on something, follow it through. So um, my one piece of advice for um, prospective students would be um, self-awareness. So really start understanding yourself, like what you like and what you don't like. And I understand, you know, um, as you guys are entering college, you will learn a lot of new things about yourself. But the sooner you learn self-awareness and understanding your strengths and your weaknesses, the better, because then if you have, if you understand your weaknesses, you know, who to partner up with, uh, you, you know who to partner up with, or if you know there's something you are really good at, you, you will know to double down on that. And you'll be able to make 
like better decisions because you made the best decision for you. So that's one thing I wish um, I did in college is just have higher self-awareness and understanding um, what you like, what you don't like, your strengths and your weaknesses. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, um, all of you. We, we really do appreciate you taking the time. So Chioma, Matt, Chris, um, thank you, you know, for everything that you shared tonight. Um, and students, thank you for, for tuning in and, and spending part of your evening with us. Um, we hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy during this time. Um, you know, here at, at Case Western Reserve University, we are offering a ton of other online sessions. Um, so I will make a quick plug for those. Um, go and check them out on our website. Um, and thank you again to our panelists and have a good rest of your evening. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us.